Yesterday, our fabulous speaker for this afternoon and I contacted me, or maybe two days ago actually, and said, oh no, I'm getting sick. Not that sick, not that one. It's okay, she's gonna be all right. But sick enough that she didn't wanna come in and cough and sneeze on you, which I think really is a good thing, right? But she also didn't want to not give you her lecture because she really wants you to know about this stuff. And I know that a lot of you really wanna know about this stuff. So through her cold, through her snuffles and her sore throat, she is going to deliver this afternoon's lecture. And we'll see how she feels for tomorrow's lecture. We may do this again. She may be here live in person. We shall see, but we're gonna do it anyway from the Stem Cell Medicine Group at the Children's Medical Research Institute. Would you please make very, very welcome through her illness, Dr. Anai Gonzalez Condero. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here and I know it has been a long day, so I'll try and keep this short, but I do have quite a few slides. And today, unfortunately, it's a day where I have to give you lots of concepts, um, but lots of cool concepts about stem cell organoids and hopefully introduce these cells so that tomorrow we can talk about the lab that the work that we do in the lab uh, on developing advanced uh, therapy. So today is a, is a baseline, baseline on knowledge and tomorrow is the fun, fun stuff that we do in the lab. And hopefully as Chris mentioned, I'll be able to be there in person because it's much nicer. Uh, so I just wanted to start by introducing the team because I lead the team, but the guys in the ground, the, the guys that do everything every day are these ones. And we actually have a larger team now, but um, a few of them are here. And what we do in the lab is to study inherited blindness. And we use our my favorite cells, which are stem cells and uh, photoreceptor cells, which are, I will explain what they are later. But um, our model, our preferred model is stem cells and organoids from human cells. So uh, I just thought I would give a, a bit of a background on myself because of a, such a, uh, you guys come from all over the, the world. So I thought I would also introduce myself so you know my background. So I did my degree at University College London. I lived in the UK for 20 years before coming to Australia. Um, so I did my degree in developmental biology and then a PhD in ophthalmology. Uh, in the cell engine therapy group. But as you can see by my accent, I'm actually not from London and from the UK. I was born in Brazil uh, and I studied, I started my university in Brazil in this countryside town, actually a quite good university in Brazil uh, in, when was it? Nine, in the 90s, 1999. And when I started, I just put here a, a small you know, timeline of what was happening at the time that I started. So Dolly the Sheep was, had just been cloned at that time. So it was a big thing and studying embryology and developmental biology was quite cool. And even though I was doing a biology degree, that was something that I, I was very interested in. So in 2002, I moved to the UK to stay there for six months just to learn English. But 20 years later, I was still there. I went back to, to university and I um, I was really, you know, humble when I started university at uh, UCL because I was actually having lectures in the building where Darwin did a few of their experiments. And, and I mean, to me, it was unbelievable that I was there. Um, and I had um, lessons with some of the uh, main guys that developed the, that study gastrulation and developmental biology at, at UCL. And again, at that time, uh, mouse embryonic stem cells were starting to be developed and human stem cells were also on the, on the game, but we didn't know anything about induced pluripotent stem cells, for example, which all of it I will explain to you today. So uh, after my degree, I went on to do a welcome trust PG, which people from the UK know the Welcome Trust is a really big um, foundation that funds research. And I did a, a four-year PhD program in stem cell and developmental biology. And what was quite cool about this program is that I could ex have experience for three months of my first year on three different labs. 
So on uh, the first lab was on zebrafish development. So I studied um, the tecton development, eye development, tecton development in the in the fish, and then I I did a little bit of a heart development period in mouse uh, in, in in the Institute of uh, Child Health with Professor Paul Riley, and then my final one was with Professor Robin Ali at the Institute of Ophthalmology, where I started working with embryonic stem cells. And that's where my passion started. So I just wanted to give you this background because it's so varied and it just tells you that, it, I mean, independent of where you are, uh, what you want to study, just, you know, enjoy the moment and, and explore your, your ideas so that you can finally find uh, something that you like. The main thing is that you have to do something that makes you happy. And stem cells make me very happy. And I was even happier when uh, um, I was invited to set up my group here in Sydney. I'm actually at Westmead, which is 40 minutes on, on the train from, uh, from the University of Sydney, so the main campus. And I established uh, my stem cell group, my stem cell medicine group, and a stem cell and organoid facility. And I've been here for almost five years now. So let's start on the research and, and on the biology here. So the basis of human life, as you all know, of course, start with one cell, one fertilized egg, and then divisions occur until a stage where, of course, you have a whole uh, human embryo. But within this period, there's lots of interesting periods that we need to understand uh, if we are to understand stem cells. Stem cells are very uh, important for us because our bodies uh, are made of a three, uh, 30 trillion cells, 30 to 40 trillion cells. And we have over 200 different cell types, but all these cell types are formed from stem cells. So that very initial population of stem cells that are present in the embryo will give rise to all the specialized cells in the body. So I always joke, and this is a, a, a really a cartoony uh, slide, but I always joke that the stem cells are our babies. And you see why throughout my presentation. But stem cells are the cells that are always thinking, what am I going to be when I grow up? You know, I can be anything. They can be an accountant, a gardener, a doctor, lawyer, whatever they want to be, they can be. Of course, in real life, what the stem cell wants to be, it's a different cell type or maybe another stem cell. So what are stem cells? So for you to characterize a cell as a stem cell, they need to have three general properties, okay? They need to be unspecialized cells. That means they can generate any cell type in your body, OK, and they need to self renew. So they need to copy itself, replicate itself to maintain that pool of daughter cells. OK, and of course, they also need to differentiate. So that's specialized into a different cell type in your body. So um, why self renew and differentiation? So. An undifferentiated cell needs to, as I said before, needs to self-renew to maintain the pool. So they divide and maintain the, the stem cell pool, but they can also divide and become another differentiated cells because we need these cells to replace uh, damaged cells, dead cells in our body, or even just for us to grow. So as you can see here, each stem cell will then become a differentiated cell, but in the end, they will self-renew and form another stem cell. So types of cell division that comes from the stem cells are symmetric and asymmetric divisions, right? So symmetric divisions will uh, produce two stem cells, two of themselves, so that self-renew capability that I just mentioned, or produce two differentiated cells. But they are always the same cells, okay, that the progeny is producing, and that the stem cell is producing. A symmetric division, the stem cell will produce a new stem cell and a differentiated cell. So this is at the end when they are starting to decide, okay, now I'm going to differentiate, they can have this all these choices. And it's important that you know the types of cell divisions. 
So another key concept here, it's what is differentiation. So I keep mentioning differentiation and the potential of the stem cells to differentiate. But differentiation is actually what um, generates cellular diversity in our in our body in, in an individual. So that's the process of um, cells becoming different, basically. So they become structurally and functionally different from each other, all the way from your pluripotent stem cells that have the capacity to generate all your cells, to progenitor cells, to more mature cell types, and then finally the very mature cell type that it could be a heart cardiomyocyte that beats or a neuron that transmits a message. So uh, differentiation is a mode stage process and it, it's, um, it accounts for acquires characteristics as the cells are specialized. So again, is this commitment to, to a more mature phenotype. And most of the time, a terminal differentiation will lead to a cell that can no longer um, proliferate and is now in, the, in its final form in the organ that it needs to be. Okay, another concept that we need to understand here is potency. So potency specifies the differentiation potential, i.e. the potential to differentiate into different cell types. Okay, so if, if I talk about a totipotent cell, is that because this cell, so the zygote, for example, can give rise to all the cell types in your body, not just the cell types, but also the extra embryonic tissue, the trophoblast that an embryo contains. So we can construct a complete and viable individual. Pluripotent stem cells are one step along the hierarchy. So that's your blastocyst stage. Those are the embryonic stem cells and the iPSCs that I will explain what they are in a minute, but I'm sure you have heard of them. So these are cells that are obtained from this stage here, the blastocyst stage, and are the purple cells that I'm showing here, um, the, the, which is the inner cell mass of the embryo. So these are capable of giving rise to all the cell types in the body. And when I talk about pluripotent stem cells, I'm talking about embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotent stem cells. And actually these are the majority of cells. That, these are the cells that we work with in the lab most of the time. And as I said, they are the descendants of the totipotent, one step down the line. Now, if we start to become more specialized, then you have a multipotent cell where they are capable to give rise to all cell types, but of a particular organ. They are now committed to that place where they live. Okay. So they can still differentiate into close related cells within the liver, for example, let's say, or, or in your blood, but they are more committed. And then you finally, you have the nullipotent cell where they're not capable of giving rise to other cell type. They can only give rise to their own um, uh, type of cell. Okay, type of stem cells. So we have three types here, uh, adult stem cells that you guys probably heard a lot about, which is a pool of multipotent. So these are not pluripotent. They cannot give rise to all the cell types, but they are multipotent stem cells that persists in several adult tissues. And they are able to generate types of cells present in, in the tissue where they reside. So for example, in the brain, in, in, in the blood, in the bone marrow, you're going to have adult stem cells, a, a multipotent population there to replace damaged cells, to replace um, uh, cells that have died. Embryonic stem cells are the ones I just mentioned. So that there we go. Here we have the blastocyst again. And so it's a very early embryo, around four to five days old. And the, again, the cells in, in gray here are the one, the inner cell mass where we get the embryonic stem cells from. So they self-renew and can give rise to all the cells, somatic cells in an organism. Induced prepotent stem cells are reprogrammed somatic cells which have the characteristics of embryonic stem cells. I will explain exactly what they are, but right now you can um, just think about induced pluripotent stem cells as embryonic stem cells. They're very similar. Okay, let's uh, dig into ad adult stem cells. Just a few examples very briefly. 
So they are found around your body, as I mentioned. So you have uh, other stem cells at the surface of your eye. You have it in the brain, in the breast, in the skin, bone marrow, testicles, muscles. So a lot of your tissues will have this population. One example here, it's uh, blood cells that are found in your uh, bone marrow. So your blood uh, needs to be renewed every day. So to give you an idea, 100,000 million cells uh, are produced daily, blood cells are produced daily. So uh, they need to go from a multipotent stent that is highly proliferative, so dividing a lot in your bone marrow to become the specialized cell types of your body, so uh, of your blood, red, white, platelet cells. Another source, uh, um, so just to remind you here, so these cells are highly proliferative, as I said, they are self-renew, uh, but they're more like the committed progenitors. So they are this type of uh, uh, transient amplifying cells. So they're multipotent, uh, they divide rapidly, but they don't self-renew itself. And they form the specialized cells that can work and, and you know, be the, do the functions that they need to in the organ. Uh, another example, it's uh, neuro, neuro stem cells. So these are uh, uh, neural cells that reside in your brain, in the subventricular zone and the subgranular zone of your brain. So actually the, the brain has the capacity to proliferate. For a long time in the field, we thought this wasn't possible, but there, there is this population there that can actually proliferate. This, these are the neural stem cells. So then again, that same stage, neural stem cells, then they go are committed progenitors that then can give rise to new neurons, new interneurons, oligodendrocytes, and astrocytes. So they allow for the neuroplasticity of the human brain, which to a certain extent we all need. Another example are gut stem cells. Again, the same thing in the in in the in your uh, the crypt of your small intestine, you will have a, a, a stem cell population there that it then commits into progenitors and can then give rise to globet cells, endocrine cells, all the cells that you need in your gut. Same thing for mesenchymal stem cells. When you hear about mesenchymal stem cells, and there's quite a few treatments out there using mesenchymal stem cells in, in clinical trials, I have to say, you know, these are the cells that come from the bone marrow. They are a bit more uh, plastic, uh, so they won't just give rise to to blood cells, but they can give rise to bones, cartilage, fats in the form of adipocytes. So it's more of a multi-lineage differentiation that the mesenchymal stem cells have. And therefore they've been using a bit more as source of growth factors in organs for transplantation and so on. But it's still they are generating more committed cell types such as bone, cartilage, and fat, okay? But if you want to generate specialized cells for the niche of, for your niche of interest, which in my case is the eye, you would use embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells. These are the true pluripotent stem cells. These are the ones that can give rise to any cell type. And nowadays, really, believe me, we can generate pretty much everything in the dish. So how do we do that? Where can we find that? Again, we get the blastocyst four to five days old embryo, we can isolate the inner cell mass, leave the trophoectoderm behind, plate these cells, so dissociate these cells, just mush it up and then plate in your dish, in, your, in the lab to grow these cells and to expand these cells. So remember, these cells are going to divide, divide, grow, and they actually have very peculiar uh, demands. They're very demanding. They're like babies again, and I'll explain that later. Um, so we can culture the cells and actually bank them and have banks and with uh, lots and lots of vials of cells to use in research. So mouse embryonic stem cells were the first ones to be discovered. They were discovered in the in, in the eighties, early eighties, by two independent groups. And here you just have images of the oocyte, the zygote, four cells, eight cells, moral stage, and the blastocyst. And here you can again see this very tiny mass. It's the remarkable inner cell mass that just generates your whole body. It's amazing. Human and a monkey and human uh, yes, cells were isolated 10 years later, 
uh, by Thompson et al. So uh, uh, both uh, Thompson uh, isolated both monkey and human cells. And again, here just showing you uh, a blastocyst, a human blastocyst with the human uh, with the inner cell mass in the middle, and how we can then. Uh, isolate these cells and grow them in cultures. At the time, we actually had to culture these cells in um, fibroblasts, so somatic cells that can uh, uh, just su sustain their growth. And, and we would see these typical colonies um, with the arrows here, these typical colonies of stem cells growing. So we need to be able to be 100% sure that we have stem cells. There are a few characteristics that we need to look for. So they need to be, of course, undifferentiated cells. So that those unspecialized cells types. They need to be health cells, of course. They need to have pluripotency markers. So these are markers that we know are expressed early in the stem cells. Uh, and we know what they are. They need to be. Uh, they they need. We need to do karyotypic uh, analysis because they need to be free of karyotypic ab abnormalities. If we are to use them in the lab, we don't want those abnormalities to be present. And remember, these cells are proliferating, dividing constantly. So there is a quite go a, a good chance that that will happen sometime. Um, we need to subculture, so keep culturing these cells for a long period in time and also freeze, be able to freeze and for the cells for our use. And of course, the most important thing is that these cells need to be able to differentiate, so generate the three germ layers, so the cells of interest in, in the embryo. So here again, just uh, showing you uh, one example of what we've done. So this is um, mouse embryonic stem cells actually. So in pink, the blastocyst again, we isolated. Now you can see that the colonies of stem cells are growing uh, without feeders. So the field evolved to grow these cells in matrices that they no longer need the other population there. And why is that important? Because when we start the process of differentiation to generate these neurons, so in pink here, you have an um, like thousands and thousands of neural stem cells that we have differentiated in the lab, we have generated in the lab. So we wanted to come from a pure population of stem cells. We don't want the other somatic cells there in a way um, messing up with our differentiation. So it was very important to generate colonies that are pure. And then again, we can push these neural stem cells to differentiate into more mature cell types, such as more mature neurons. So once again, embryonic stem cells can be kept at proliferative state, so they can divide. They are on an undifferentiated state for long periods of time in vitro, and they can generate, they can be stimulated to generate specialized cells. When I talk about differentiation and this stimulation of turning a embryonic stem cell into skin, neurons, blood, liver, uh, what we actually do in the lab is to provide growth conditions that will um, tell the embryonic stem cell to become a skin, will tell the embryonic stem cell to become a neuron. It does sound a bit of a, um, uh, you know, it's difficult for you to conceptualize when I just say, yeah, we will tell the cell, we'll give growth factors, we give different media for these cells. But it's important that you understand that this is all based on developmental biology. So the growth conditions that we have established for the different cell types that we generate in the lab are based on developmental biology. And I'll come back to that later after I explain induced pluripotent um, stem cells or iPSCs for short. So iPSCs, it, it was really, really a breakthrough in research, in stem cell research and in research in general. So they were discovered in 2006 by Shinya Manaka in Japan. So less than 20 years. It, it's, I mean, to me, for you guys, maybe it's still, it's already old, but to me, it's, it's quite new in the field. Uh, Shinya Manaka won the Nobel Prize in 2012 for um, the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2012 for this discovery. So what he did was to actually now turn that specialized cells so the your your lawyer your your doctor cell you know your muscle your heart cell back in time to transform these adult cells in stem cells so that's it that's the paper 2006 paper in cell 
uh, landmark study, as I said, and it has really revolutionized the stem cell field. Now, what happens is that any lab can access an unlimited supply of pluripotent stem cells. And of course, this is important because now we're not, we don't need to use embryos anymore. So we avoid all that ethic, ethical discussion about using embryonic stem cells and, and um and embryos. But how does he do? What did he do to, to uh, generate uh, pretty potent stem cells? So he discovered, I mean, he tested um, over 20 factors that he knew were present in the embryonic stem cells. So these are, are genes that are turned on, proteins that are turned on in the embryonic stem cells. And one by one, he starts at uh, turning it off and turning it on these genes until he found a cocktail of four transcription factors, OC3-4, SOX2, KLF4, and CMYK, which now we call them the Yamanaka factors, um, that were absolutely necessary to transform a cell such as skin cell into iPSC, so into embryonic stem cells. So this was the genetic induction of a somatic cell to generate embryonic stem cell-like cells. He identified these critical genes that must be present in prepotent cells, and now we call them the Yamanaka factors. So how does this work? What do we do? We reprogram the cell. So if you if you hear this this word reprogramming, it just means that you're turning a somatic cell, a blood or a skin cell into stem cells. So you are, you are inducing that transformation. That's why they, they were called induced pluripotent stem cells. So you can take now cells from any individual, any, and it, it's as simple as getting a, a tube of blood. You isolate, of course, the certain populations that you want from the blood and you expand these populations and you basically introduce this Yamanaka factors. And in a period of three months, the blood cells that are floating will start to attach. Some of them, of course, the ones that have received all four um, uh, factors, uh, will start to attach in the dish and will form these beautiful colonies of iPSCs. So this is what we do in the lab. We, we receive, let's say we need to study a disease, an eye condition, for example, where I can um, obtain some blood or skin, fibroblasts from a patient, for example, I can isolate this cell. So that's the cell preparation stage. And then we'll start our reprogramming. So we have plasmids that uh, have these four factors that I mentioned before in our lab. And basically this small machine here will then introduce these factors inside the cell by electroporation. So electroporation will just make the cell membrane, um, will basically poke, poke holes in the cell membrane. You have pores forming, and then the factors will go in. If all four factors are present and expressed, then we have the iPSCs forming after a period of time. And as I said, and then of course we need to characterize these cells. Again, they need to be able to proliferate, they need to express pluripotent markers, they need to have a good karyotype, everything that I mentioned before to you. So uh, there's various ways of reprogramming, of actually introducing those four factors into the cells, into the blood or the skin. So, uh, and, and also you can use a number of other somatic cells. Like we, in the lab, we do routinely use blood because blood is quite easy to obtain but you can also use hair cells or adipocytes, melanocytes, keratinocytes. Of course, some cells are easier than others to, to reprogram, but it can be done. And then you have lots of uh, ways you can actually use viral vectors to introduce this, um, these four factors inside the cell. So then basically it's just a delivery system. Use the potential of the virus to, to deliver these factors. Of course, these are viruses that are, have been modified, so they're not going to damage the cell. 
You can use plasmids, as I said. So these are just bacterial plasmids that so circular pieces of DNA that we can uh, modify and add our genes of interest. So for example, the four factors, and then introduce that into the cell via the electroporation, as I mentioned before, or protein. Purified protein can also do. And again, we would introduce the purified protein through electroporation. So yeah, just a bit of a, a specific uh, topic here, but it's just for you to understand how we can introduce the factors inside the somatic cell, the blood, for example. Uh, here again, just another curiosity fact. So as I said, we have uh, in this case, a fibroblast growing there. So this is spindle-like shape cells that you see here, a fibroblast. But then hopefully you can see that they start to form this tiny ball. So this is after we electroporated the factors, okay? So with time, these tiny balls of cells, that they start to change uh, shape. And they start to form these colonies that start to kind of, stem cells like to be together, okay? They need to be on that beautiful colony that I showed you before. So this is what is starting to happen here. And then what we need to do to make sure that it comes from a single purified stem cell is to isolate these cells. So we would manually go there and pick this colony and then grow this colony further here, as we're showing here, to be able to demonstrate that we have cells, an IPS cell line that came from a single clone. So it needs to always come from a purified one cell uh, so that we have a purified culture of IPS cells. Okay, so what are the advantages of IPS cells? So as I said before, now we don't need to use embryos to uh, um, make embryonic stem cells. We can tell, take these cells from any patient, any healthy individual. We can have uh, cells from children with disease, and we can have cells from people with different genetic makeups, which is so important for us because we want to be studying this diversity that is out there. We don't want to be developing therapies based on one patient on one sample. So this is what we call personalized medicine. So person-specific induced pluripotent stem cells can be derived, generated in the lab. We can differentiate then into, so basically generate our organ of interest in the lab as well. And then study these diseases, study these cells. And remember, these are human cells. We are no longer talking about zebrafish, cynipus, which are very important models, but now we can have human cells growing in the lab. Okay, so when I said that the stem cells were like babies, it's because they really need a specialized way of culturing and maintaining them. Because remember, we need to maintain them pluripotent. If they become too different, if they start to differentiate, they're not gonna be good for our experiments. So basically we have to grow them. As I said before, we would have live feeder cells, but nowadays we don't use it anymore we have extracellular matrix. So decellularized uh, extracellular matrix that can sustain the growth of these cells. And these are matrigel, gel tracks, so different engineered um, type of extracellular matrix. These cells are proliferating uh, very quickly. So they actually need media change, so specialized media every day. Every day we need to change the meat and give new food and proteins and growth factors to these cells. So for example, uh, FGF2 and TGF beta. So these are some of the growth factors that we use from the media. And we all actually need to break up the colony so they have an optimal cultural condition. You don't want them to that colony to grow too large because if they get too large, it's almost they start to tell each other, if they start to touch each other, they start to tell each other, oh, let's start differentiating. So what we need to keep is the stem cells at around 60% confluency. So that means the colony is only, we want 60% of the plate covered in, in stem cells. So when we reach that, we have to break up the cells again, so dissociate the cells and then split them. So play them again at a lower confluence in another in a new dish. So that happens every week in the lab. So if you want to use stem cells to do research, we need to actually look after them and change media every day. And we need to split them 
every week. And we need to bank, 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 have banks of these cells for research. Okay, so stem cells, they're all about niches, okay? As I said, I just explained that they need the media, they grow factors, but they also need a, spe a special um, matrix. So we need to create that optimal microenvironment so that they keep um, uh, self-renewing and they are good at differentiating. Many, many times in the lab I tell my students, are you looking after your stem cell? If your stem cell is overgrown, if you don't split them uh, when they should, they will not differentiate into the retinal cells that you want. And then one day they look, okay, ah, no, they will do, I can do it tomorrow, be fine. No, because that's gonna mess up down the line your differentiation protocol. So it's very, very important that we keep the niche. So if we go back to that growth condition again, how we differentiate these cells, how do we know what to give these cells to become a skin or a neuron? It's all, as I said, based on, on developmental biology <laughs> and the niche that these cells are growing on. So stem cells have all their genes turn, turned on. Differentiated cells have just some set of genes turned on. Um, genes that are involved in muscle development will be turned on in cells that will become muscle. Livers, uh, liver cells will have the genes that are important for liver development. So again, we are trying to create the correct niche for the stem cell to differentiate into the cell of interest. So it's not only genes, it's actually the whole landscape. So the environment, which we call the epigenetic status of the cell. I'm not gonna go into that because it's too much, but basically it, we are back to that story where we have our totipotent cell at the top of the hill and that cell can become anything. But then where they, when they go down the hill and they start to find new different pathways, they become more committed until the time where the multipotent cell or the unipotent cell is now committed to the, to the lineage of interest. And that's to do with the genes that they express, but also to the landscape around it, what they were exposed. So the niche that we provided to that cell. And basically what we want, the niches that we want to form are your ectoderm, your three germ layers, your ectoderm, your mesoderm, and your endoderm. So your ectoderm will form the exoskeleton, so the outside, the mesoderm will develop into your organs and the endoderm will form the lining of your organs. So how do we know which genes we need to turn on to do ectoderm versus mesoderm versus ectoderm? I'll go back again to the developmental biology. And here's just some examples of landmark studies that were done, and I mean, when I say I use, I love human organoids and I love human stem cells, but I pay all my, I have a lot of respect for all the developmental biologists out there that did all their discoveries in Xenopus levis, cheek, mouse, zebrafish, C. elegans, fruit flies. So all these studies were so important for us to understand what are the factors that are necessary to develop an eye? What are the factors that are necessary to develop a whole trunk? So Hans Pimann is the father of the organized very early on in the in, in his career, he actually transplanted, he did microsurgery in salamander embryos, and then he isolated a region on the anterior um, part of the embryo. And then he transplanted that to the posterior part. And then what he realized is that he could form a whole new eye at the back of the animal, just because he removed that region. So he postulated that growth, the, the factors, the, the messaging uh, uh, on that area are important to form an eye. And then of course he went on to study what were these factors, what uh, not just him, but many scientists discovered what is important for eye development. Hild Mangold in 1924, she was a student of a, a PhD student of Spiman. She um, transplanted the organizer again of the gastrolating egg to another region and, and to a donor actually, and she marked it with a dye in, in red there. And she realized that she could form now a whole trunk. So head, eyes, and the uh, anterior part of the body just by doing the transplantation of that organizer graft. 
So very important studies that told us a lot. And because of these studies, now we know how to grow the stem cells and what to add to the stem cells to generate the cells of interest. So here you have Xenopo zebra fish and all the transcription factors that are necessary for eye specification. As I said, stem cell biology started using these factors to, um, in, in the stem cells to generate the cells of interest. But at the beginning, we actually did it as a 2D culture. So just plating the stem cells in as a monolayer in the dish and adding these factors. Right, the field evolved to then have these cells growing in suspension as as a three dimensional uh, entity. We also had the extracellular matrix to allow the cells to grow better. So we became more specialized, and we are able to now generate better models, which we call organoids. So hopefully, here you can see the difference of a, of Rhodopsin positive rods. So these are rod cells that we have grown from stem cells. And when you grow them into D, monolayer, they're all messed. I mean, there's a few cells there and they're nice um, rhodopsin positive cells, but all messy. But when you grow them in suspension, and I'll go and explain this, they can laminate, they can reside in the area where they should, and they look just like a rod cone should. So these are a, a brief introduction to 3D models or what we call organoids that better mimic that niche. Again, it's back to that perfect niche formation that we look for when we are generating cells. So here's just a cartoon an analogy of what I just said. You can generate eye cells, brain cells from stem cells in the dish. And we do that because, of course, we can't take eye cells from the patient. We can't take brain cells from the patient. So stem cells are there to provide a renewable source of cells to generate every cell in your body. But of course, eyes and brains are complex. I'm showing here on, on the right a bunch of neuron and astrocytes. So in cyan in blue, you have lots of neurons that we have generated in the lab. And in pink, we have astrocytes that live together with neurons in the brain. Beautiful, but it's still, they're trying to form network, but in, in, in a two-dimensional environment. Can we actually make an eye or, or a retina or a brain that it's a more, um, that mimics better the environment where they live? And that's where the concept of uh, uh, three-dimensionality and grouping cells come. Uh, very early on, researchers realized that if they broke up the cultures, uh, dissociated the stem cells, and they grouped them together into form, into basically a ball of cells, which we call embryonic body, these cells would start telling each other, okay, we are ready to differentiate, ready to form our niche. So it's almost a self a forming self-organizing environment when these cells go into 3D. And again, we can also provide extracellular matrix around it. So matrix is a typical one that enhances this capability. So this bow of cells now becomes the embryonic body, which later on we call organoids. So again, here just showing that you have your group of stem cells that will become a group of eye cells. And in the end, they all instruct each other in this three dimension uh, structure to form a mini retina. Uh, in the dish, for example, because that's what we, we want to do. But we can also make mini brains, mini neural uh, uh, cell population, liver, kidneys, heart, and so on. So basically, we make a, a, a retina. It's not the whole eye, okay? And it's important that you understand that. It's basically the retina, which is the tissue that sits at the back of your eye and is responsible for light sensitivity. So that's where your photoreceptors reside. We don't have a lens. We don't have choroid, which is the blood supply around it. Um, but these cells can be generated in, in, in isolation, and then we could perhaps combine it. And I'll show you some cool stuff that we've been doing in the lab later. So everything started, and there were a few uh, publications before this, but the most important uh, paper was this one from, Chin, um, 
from Sasai's group in Japan. So the Japanese are indeed the pioneers in IPS and, and stem cell differentiation. So basically he was the one that realized that making this three-dimensional ball of stem cells would generate better models. And here he did the ball is a three, four, uh, your EB there. And in green, he had a marker. So in, uh, this green fluorescent protein turns on when you have an eye being formed. So it's under the control of this uh, RAX RX promoter, which is specific to the eye. And you can see here the two vesicles that will form the eye coming out in this EB. Seven days later, this is mouse. So it's the development is quicker, but it's still it's remarkable that we could generate these cells. He would isolate them. He isolated these optic vesicles, culture them longer in culture for 30 days, and he was able to show the formation of photoreceptor cells again in that laminated structure. So this was indeed uh, uh, it, it, it changed the field for us. And now, of course, nowadays we have many, many, many different protocols. You know, we have some that are three-dimensional. So you form this, uh, uh, Sasai's group also did the human cells. So these are all with human cells now showing the, the mini retinas growing there. You have some that are grown in 2D. So first you have your monolayer and then you have the physicals coming out of it and so on. So there's a flavor, uh, a number of protocols that one can use. Okay. So to summarize, and I'm sorry, we have a patient that comes into the hospital and has a genetic condition. We don't know what it is, perhaps, so we can do uh, sequencing to figure out what mutation uh, this patient has. We can then, and if we know it has a, a retinopathy, for example, disease of the, the retina, we can isolate the blood, we can generate iPSCs, we can differentiate these cells into our retinal organoids. And now we have thousands and thousands of these retinal organoids to do experiments, basically, to try and understand what the disease is doing to these cells, but in the human context, right? Basically, what we want to do for the majority of the time is to try and generate disease in the dish. So for the retina, we have to um, culture these cells for over six months. So the students, the postdocs in the lab grow cells for a long period of time. And we don't mind that because we are trying to replicate normal eye development here. So we want the cells to grow at their own pace. And then of course, we are going to understand disease further, but we are also going to have thousands of organoids to test new therapies. So you can test drugs, you can test gene therapies, cell therapies, and I will explain all of that tomorrow. How about other organoids? I did mention a lot, the retinal organoids, but how about other organs? Here I'm showing you a bunch of lung organoids that we have grown in the lab from stem cells. So all these circles, these tiny bubbles that you see there are actually um, alveoli organoids that we can grow from stem cells. So very cool. We can also grow brain organoids, as I mentioned before, and various types of brain organoids. So we can grow cortical organoids here, which we know is cortical because we have analyzed, we have done a number of experiments with these organoids, and they have this typical um, rosette-like morphology there. We have whole cerebral organoids that can generate um, different parts of the brain. So hippocampus, choroid plexus, hind brain, mid brain. And here is just for you to see the size that these organoids, uh, they're quite large in the dish. We can also generate organoids. And this is something that we published recently. Cortical organoids that well, uh, cortical organoid, so the brain organoid that grows very close to your retinal vesicle. So basically you have an eye and a brain, and when we culture them together in suspension, we can see that these two populations start to talk to each other. And I'll show some um, a bit more on this study tomorrow. Uh, we can grow cardiac organoids, and let's hope this will play here. I stopped. Yeah. So if you pay attention, you can see that the cardiac organ, so the heart organ, it has chambers and it's also beating. So it has cardiomyocytes that can beat and um, 
and we have again characterized, we have various markers here. So CD31 is a marker for endothelial cells. So those are the blood vessels inside the heart organoid. We have ventricular cells, we have iatria cells. So all the different parts of the heart are being formed from our cardiac organoids that we generated from stem cells. We can also go further. Okay, so here I'm just showing an um, equipment that we have in the lab that is basically, you can put your brain organoid in it. It has electrodes and it will me measure the functionality of the brain organoids. Of course, neurons fire and they transmit electrical input. So we can actually now use that to analyze the function. So if you have a disease, organoid, so an epileptic brain organoid, let's say, and a normal one, you can compare the functionality in vitro. And we have this in the lab. We also looking at scaling up. So we need to produce lots and lots of these organoids. So we actually have a robot in the lab that can grow these cells for us. So here you seeing our uh, system that we can grow these cells. And indeed, it helps a lot, the, the, the students and the postdocs. Um, and again, this is just an overview of what I do. We use this organoids to do cell therapy. This is modeling and gene therapy. We are looking into engineering more complex organoids. And we also want to understand human development. And I'm going to finish by playing the video, and I can cut it short. But it's just a little bit of a flavor of what I'm going to discuss tomorrow so that you guys can be prepared for what the, the science that I'm going to show tomorrow. Welcome to the Children's Medical Research Institute, home of the stem cell medicine team and the stem cell and organoid facility, established by group leader Dr. Anai Gonzalez Cordero. CMRI stem cell research focuses on groundbreaking iPS cell and organoid technology in the field of genetic diseases, which prompts the question, what are iPS cells? Induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPS cells for short, are regular stem cells with one key characteristic. They are extracted and developed from adult somatic cells, such as blood. IPS cells can then be used to generate various cell types, and most remarkably, they can develop into organoids, many organs that offer a unique chance to model human disease and develop genetic therapies based on a limitless supply of research cells. In researching the incredible possibilities offered by IPS cells, we have successfully grown human organoids in the laboratory. These organoids are functionally and genetically accurate representations of tissue structures from organs such as heart, brain, and eyes. Stem cell medicine group's core focus are structures within the human eye. The stem cell medicine group investigates restorative genetic therapies using state-of-the-art viral vector technology and CRISPR gene editing for a range of inherited retinal conditions. Another main interest of the group is highlighted by their high impact publications documenting their successes in cell therapy by transplantation of the light sensing cells of the eye, the photoreceptor cells. These human cells can connect once in the eye, restoring sight function in laboratory blind mice. And now the question must be asked, what does the future hold? With our sights set on developing our cell therapy program further into human trials in the near future, we are investigating the generation of a macular transplant patch from organoids. We are focusing on combining biomedical engineering to enhance transplantation outcome, moving towards treatments for retinitis pigmentosa and age-related macular degeneration. This is an exciting time to be in the field of stem cell research. And thanks to the Stem Cell Medicine Group and the Stem Cell and Organoid Facility, we are proud to offer these technologies. Okay. Well. And thank you. <laughs>